another way that we try to make things really interactive is we actually I don't I don't introduce the presenters. We have people that they just met at this event do the introducing. So uh, Rebecca um, is Rebecca's introducer here. Do you know who you are? Yep. Um, what's your name? A, a warm welcome for Jessica, please. Um, my name is Jessica Chiquette, and I'm the American Craft Council librarian. And um, I want to thank Colin uh, for the warm welcome that he gave and for the uh, introduction to the library. Um, but actually, I'm here to introduce Rebecca Yaker, um, who is a very talented fiber artist. Uh, she wrote a wonderful book that I reference all the time called One Yard Wonders. Uh, and she lives in Northeast. Uh, she loves Ethiopian food and she studied Russian languages and literature. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce Rebecca Yaker. The title of my presentation that I chose is The Trials and Tribulations of Writing a Popular Craft Book. Because it's trying and tribulating. Um, so I co-authored a book called One Yard Wonders with my good friend Patricia Hoskins, who some people may know because she owns Crafty Planet in Northeast Minneapolis. So for you crafty types. Um, anyway, we had, talked, we had talked a bit about writing a book together. It was just something that we wanted to do. It seemed like a fun idea. We both loved to sew, and we, we really felt that there was a need for a sewing book for men because there's really not a lot out there for men. And we know men who sew. And we know people who also want to sew things for their men. So Trish was in contact with somebody at a publisher called Story Publishing, which is um, an imprint of Workmen, if you've heard of Workmen. And um, they're out of Massachusetts. And in 2007, Trish had spoken to an acquisitions editor there and said, hey, we've got this idea for a great book. Um, it's a men's sewing book. And the response was, that's a difficult sell. But they still invited us to put a proposal together, and we didn't, because I don't know, why bother, kind of. But we moved on. And um, funny thing that happened, so that was, that was late in 2007. In February 2008, some people were here um, from Story Publishing, and they had arranged a lunch date with Trish, and Trish invited me to this lunch date, and we went to Then Pop in Northeast Minneapolis. And it was a great lunch and we had a lot of conversation and at the end of our lunch they invited us to put together a proposal for a book totally random and fortunate and um, story publishing is the publisher behind a series of knitting books called 101 one skein wonders for anybody who knits does anybody know those books and um, great success and they were looking at branching out and getting into the sewing market so this was going to be their launch. Um, anyway, a lot of people wonder what's involved in putting together a proposal for a book. And if you're serious about putting together a proposal for a book, we actually have copies here on the table that you are welcome to, to see what's involved, at least what story publishing asks. Um, at the end of the day, our proposal, which took us about two months to put together, was 19 pages long, included sample text, um, information about ourselves, writing samples of our own, and um, our writing samples were kind of random because we didn't have anything published, and we weren't bloggers, but we winged it, and they liked it, so it was great. Um, anyway, we submitted our proposal in April, late April of 2008, and our original proposal, our idea was for a sewing book that it would have 35 to 40 projects and probably be about 175 pages in length because that was pretty much the going number of projects in a typical sewing book. And we were thinking, oh, you know, we're going to create all these great one yard projects and it's going to be, it's going to be so interesting and unique. And a month later, they come back to us and say, great, your proposal's great. We want 101 projects. And we're like, are you kidding me? I mean, between us, we didn't say this to them because we don't, we don't want to miss this opportunity to be involved and to write this book. So we're thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to come up with 101 projects? Um, and in the end, it ended up being much like the One Skein series, a contributor-based book. Um, so the, basically what we did, and this 
this is uh, very high level and sounds very easy, I think. Uh, we developed an initial outline of the book organization and project types. We solicited projects from contributors. We created a manuscript from the accepted submissions. Uh, we created a complete and consistent text. We noted the required illustrations and we wrote the introductory material. Sounds pretty concise and easy, right? You think? Um, I will tell you in the end, I said, I will never do this again. I will also tell you that we are currently working on our third book. <laughs> A little drink. So, um, we received, so as I said, we turned in a proposal in April. We s received a first draft of a contract in middle of June. And having no experience, we get this contract and we're like, what does this even say? What are we agreeing to? Is this okay? And a question is off often comes up is, do you have an agent or did you have an agent? And we don't. And we don't think we need one. And we don't really want one. And we're really happy with our publisher. I don't know. I can't really speak to experiences with other publishers. But we think that that story is really good and fair. Um, and, and we've learned this over the years. Um, I will say that with the first contract, we looked through it. And we had somebody else look through it, like a mutual friend who had some book experience. And we kind of tried to play hardball. And they were like, you have no experience. This is your contract. It is what it is. Um, uh, to, to jump forward, for our third contract, for our most recent book, we really wanted to make sure we were getting a good deal and to plug um, a woman named Amy Bissonette, who is a local lawyer. She, somebody, somebody who whistled. I love her. <laughs> anyway, we got her name and number through Springboard for the Arts, and she is amazing. So she looked through our whole contract and was like, this is, and she actually said, your contract is very sound, which was good. I mean, there were a couple things that she said, these are deal breakers. If they do not change this, don't sign the contract, but they didn't want to lose us. So we were lucky. And it, and it wasn't even number stuff. It was more like, you know, this thing called options, which I can tell you about later if you want to know. Um, Cause that's too much information right now. Um, the, the one thing I will tell you about the contract that I totally did not understand is, you know, there's, if you're familiar with advances and then you get royalties on the book. So we got this advance for the book and I'm like, oh, this is awesome, cash in pocket. We get, we get an advance when we sign the contract and then we get the second half of our, van, our, our advance after we turn the manuscript in. Well, I had no idea that an advance means that it's an advance on your royalties and you're not going to actually get any more money until after you make back that money on the sale on the sales of your book that's how much how how much I knew how little I knew but um, it's worked out okay anyway we what we did is we put out a call for submissions um, and we just used a lot of different online forums and hope for the best that we would we were fully prepared that we were going to have to create all of these different projects and we in the end of the day we ended up receiving 200 submissions for the first book um, which was pretty much more than enough to pick through um, and then we still created some original projects of our own but I did bring some projects today some they're all one yard so we're just gonna pass them randomly and you can they're just in this so you can have some examples I think that Colin there's a tote bag in there that there's projects within that bag too I think there in that bag. Um, anyway, um, when it came down to actually writing the book, we had three months to edit the book. So we get all of these projects, we get all of these submissions, we get people's, we receive people's projects. Some we accepted as they submitted them. Others were like, we sent them a yard of fabric and asked them to remake it because originally we we're thinking, oh, are we going to have to make all these projects? And it just absolutely wasn't realistic. Um, so we have our projects in hand. Um, we're working through our editing process. And we had to get really creative because it was amazing to see the different spectrum of abilities out there in the sewing world. Um, some people made beautiful samples but kind of couldn't write a sentence to save their lives. So we had to recreate a lot of the text. Um, and you can imagine, for those of you who sew, the number of different ways you can explain to somebody how to hem a pair of pants. 
So we had to sort of standardize that and come up with standard, you know, verbiage throughout the book to make it cohesive and consistent. And I'm and to this day, I'm actually amazed that, that no contributor has come back and said, what did you do to my project? Because some of them are so, th I mean, the project, the end result is the same, but we've completely um, dissected and rewritten instructions, which, which were necessary. So it, it's a good thing in the end. Um, our manuscript was due in January of 2009. We were too late, two weeks late, which Trish insist insisted was okay. She said, oh, they're always late in the publishing world, which made me really nervous because there's this clause in the contract that says they can take their money back. But um, it, it was totally fine. Anyway, um, something interesting that happens is what happens after we turn in our manuscript. And from us, the manuscript went to a woman named Nancy Wood, who's in North Carolina, and she is our editor. And it was her responsibility over a two-week period to, um, she added style tags and went through the text again a second time to add illustration references, number them, and make up a list, which would then go to our illustrator. And this was all, these were all people who were hired by the publisher story. And our illustrator was in Chicago. In the meantime, all the completed projects are with a photographer who's in Connecticut and a stylist who's deciding how to style these projects. As a side note, we had no idea that we should actually give them a list of how we would like the projects to be shot because some things ended up not making sense or styled really strangely, but we didn't know that we were supposed to give that information. That's part of the first time learning. Um, there's another, there's also a copy editor who goes through the book and she's looking for technical things. There are other editors who are actually at the publisher's office. In the meantime, there is the design team at the publisher who's working on the layout of the book and everything else associated with the book, making it fit, packaging, how are we gonna get this thing to come together? Um, so we're thinking, we're done. Finally, we're done. Like, I can wash my hands of this because I kind of wanted to kill myself a little bit. And then the publisher comes to us in April and says, great news, Barnes & Noble wants to do a special limited edition of the book and they want, they're gonna buy 5,000 non-returnable copies and they need five extra projects in two weeks. We need to get this turned around. So then we're frantically scrambling for Barnes & Noble projects and I will tell you for the second book, we anticipated Barnes & Noble's need and we saved five pro extra projects. Um, after we finished turning those in, I went on a much needed trip with my husband to Mexico, which was great, and I thought of nothing, except that I would never do this again. And actually a friend of mine who has written many books, and she, she works through Pro Chronicle, I, I spoke to her about it, I was like, why do we do this? What are we doing? What are we thinking? She said writing books is like a sickness. You say you're never gonna do it, and then you see it, and you can't not do it again. And that's exactly what happened. When I got back from Mexico, I checked my email, and there were sample pages of the book and the cover of the book. And I was, my breath was taken away. And I said, how many other times can I do this? Like it was just amazing to see everything come together in such a beautiful form. So this is what the first book looked like, or looks like. It's real nice, right? Um, there's a pattern envelope on the inside cover. It's full color throughout. All the projects have beautiful photographs. Um, there's probably not enough illustrations, but it would have been too expensive. It's, it's a great looking book. And I mean, I'm really proud. I couldn't be more proud actually. And you can, you can check it out at the library, but there's a real long wait list. <laughs> um, I Anyway, the initial retail for this book, which is totally mind-blowing for those of you who sew, was $20.95. And if you sew and you would like to go to Joanne Fabrics or something and buy a sewing pattern or go to Crafty Planet and buy an Amy Butler pattern or whatever, what, like one pattern of one garment is like 20 bucks, and you can get this book of 101 projects for $21? Are you kidding me? Fabulous! <laughs> So anyway, the book was published. The book was published. It finally came out in um, October of 2009, which was roughly 18 months since our since our first lunch date with the publisher. 15 months that we spent actually working on it. Um, I will say this book is the like the gift that keeps on giving because you think you're done and 
um, the book is published, great. And then suddenly we get emails from the publisher, somebody at the publisher who says, mm, this person can't complete this project. Is there information missing or is the size wrong? And there, there are errors. There were errors in the first print of this book. And they've since been corrected. And by the way, the real tale has now gone up because I guess that's how they do it. But which is also great because we've reached our highest ex escalation point on our statement. So we're in like our highest earning bracket. So let them raise the retail. Great for us. Um, in the meantime, the sickness set and we sent in a proposal to do our second book. Again, One Yard Wonders because this was such a huge success. So our second book, also One Yard Wonders, is called Fabric by Fabric, and this book is arranged by fabric type instead of by project type. And the publisher had a hard time with the second book. If you can see the difference in the size of the spine, it's like an inch thicker. They were like, what? Why, are you, why have you accepted so many complicated projects and why are there so many photos and so many illustrations? But I sat there and diligently read reviews on Amazon and I just thought we should do what the people asked for, right? But so this is our second book, which, was, which is absolutely a monster. It's more than 100 pages longer than the first book. And, um, it, it's, and we're really proud of it also. Um, I will tell you that our biggest challenge with the second book, which was the manuscript was due in, I think, October 1st of 2010. I was due to give birth September 29th of 2010. So I made darn sure that my portion of the book was finished. And then on September 17th, these neighborhood hoodlums broke into our home and stole my laptop and my backup drive. And that was the biggest trial and tribulation of writing this book. <laughs> so um, the publisher was really gracious. They, ex they gave us an extension and I recreated editing of 50 projects because Trish and I pretty much split the work. Um, we have different skill set and we work great together and we're still friends. And I managed to re-edit in two and a half months, 50 projects. And this book has been out for eight months and we have yet to receive a single email asking for a correction in this book. So editing twice is the way to go. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so nothing like editing a book with this like one month old baby sort of attached to you. Which reminds me if anyone knows how to wean a child. That's my I want to know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I probably, sp I, I speak too much, but <laughs> ask me questions. <laughs> Two questions, <laughs> sorry. Or not. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, no, we did compensate people. So um, the compensation is not great. You're not gonna be rich, right, you know? submitting a project to this book. The publisher gave us um, a $10,000 budget because the idea is that each contributor would get $100 for their um, submission, which didn't, which isn't necessary, which it doesn't actually work because we have other costs associated with the book Trish and I do. So you get 65 or 75, depending on a couple variations. But you submit your project, you're in this book, you get a, you get a nice bio in the book, you get to share it with your friends and family. You get a free copy of the book. And um, a number of our contributors have actually gone on to do books of their own. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the book or not. But the book is such a success. Like in the publishing world, we were told that it was the number one craft book of 2009, which is phenomenal considering it came out in October of that year. And the initial publication, the initial printing of the book was 50,000 copies. There are currently over 200,000 copies of the first book in print. It's been published in the UK, it's been published in Australia, and I believe it's about to be published in Russia. And that has nothing to do with my Russian former ability. <laughs> yes? There is no sewing for men. <laughs> no, I didn't make it up. That was what we wanted to do originally. But, but, but there are projects for men, certainly. And yes, there would also be plush toys in these books. Um, 
Anyway, the book we're working on now is called 101 One Yard Little Wonders. It's projects for kids, not kids to do, but for you to create for the kids in your life, whether it's clothing, accessories, home, toys, games, stuff like that. Thanks. <laughs> Just a tip for you folks that don't want to introduce anybody at these events, don't wear a tie. Don't be the only one in the event in a tie. I got pulled aside by these two gentlemen, and they said, you're the only one in a tie. How would you like to introduce us? And I said, well, I guess that's great. Uh, Jim and Michael, um, I, I said, you know, I don't want to make it a boring old introduction, so why don't you tell me something interesting about you? And the one guy said, well, just with what I have on my body, I can rappel down the side of this building safely to the ground. So that is fascinating. The other guy said, well, I haven't worn pants since 2004. And the problem with this introduction is I can't remember which is which. So I'm just gonna introduce them. This is Jim and Michael, and they're from Twin Cities Maker, and they're gonna tell you all about their shop. Hi, I'm Michael Freer. I'm the development coordinator, communications director, and a founding member and founding board member of Twin Cities Maker. And, and I'm Jeff Jim Berg, <laughs> and I'm the shop manager and chief safety officer at TC Maker. Safety third. <laughs> and so we, uh, we brand ourselves as a maker space and a hacker space. And a lot of folks hear hacker, and they're like, oh, those are people breaking my computer. Well. The term hacker came out of uh, MIT where students would hack at their problem sets. They just dig into and keep working at their problem sets until they solved, got through their homework. And then when that sort of built into that community, you would hack at a problem on a computer until you solved it. So a, while a hacker doing illegal things is a hacker, someone who's, say, taking a VCR and turning it into a cat feeder is also a hacker. Um, and that's a real project. <laughs> that, that, that's published several times over, I'm not kidding you. Uh, but so, we feel that hacking is one part of making creative stuff, just as the aesthetic design elements of art are a slightly separate subset of the physical skills, such as craft. And making is a broader and different and distinct term than the certain portions that are hacking, and one is not the other and one is not you don't have to be one to be the other but you can very often be both um, so uh, three years ago now uh, a with the start of a website and a online forum uh, the seed was planted to get a bunch of makers and hackers together in the Twin Cities and the website Twin Cities Maker uh, was launched and then eventually we realized that while we were meeting in coffee shops and talking about all the different cool projects we were doing in our garages and basements and closets that we weren't really fully able to collaborate in the ways we wanted to. And Plus we got thrown out of the coffee shop. Only one. Uh, so we decided to look into launching a space. Uh, a collaborative, creative space. And Jeff is now, uh, as a former audio engineer, I should have better mic technique, I'm sorry. Um, Jeff is now the manager of our shop, and I'll let him explain a little bit about the various fiascos that go on there. So the organization is TC Maker, the space is the Hack Factory, and we alternatively call it our clubhouse, our workshop, our hangar, our hangout. Uh, when asked what is the Hack Factory, I always go back to the motto of TC Maker, so I'm, I'm, and this is supposed to be a big PowerPoint, but it's too bright to see the slide, so I'll paint word pictures. So the first slide comes up and in, on a black background with big, bold, white Helvetica, it says, make. And what the shock does is provide you with the tools necessary to make stuff. We have a wood shop with the types of tools that you would expect to see in a wood shop, and a few tools that you might not be so familiar with. Uh, like CNC routers, computer-controlled machines to cut wood in very, very precise ways. Um, we have a metal shop with six, uh, five or six different forms of welders, or at least variations on the theme, a plasma cutter, uh, a bunch of metal shaping tools, 
a Bridgeport mill, which uh, if you don't know what a mill is, it's like a drill press on steroids that can be controlled in very precise ways and move back and forth, not just up and down. We have a couple of lathes, both for wood and metal. Uh, and then you head to our back room classroom, and we have an entire electronics hacking facility, um, which includes oscilloscopes, soldering irons, computers, both for the art of computer hacking and for the art of creating the digital files necessary to use the various computer-controlled machines that make stuff. We have at least three 3D printers right now, one of them that was made in-house and as near as we can tell, although it's slow, it uh, has a much higher resolution than anything available on the market this side of ten or $15,000. Um, really nice printer. Just something that got whipped up and, one night. And I believe it cost about 150 bucks, including all of the parts. Well, that's because the really expensive part just showed up on our doorstep. But yes. <laughs> um, we have a craft studio downstairs with paints and leather working tools and sewing machines and men who sew in the basement. Don't know what they're up to. There's leather, there's sewing machines. I don't know. Don't go down there very often. We have a, a lounge space to hang out, and, uh, and that's the make portion. So making can be a lonely vocation. So the second part of our motto, and here's the other slide, share. So the idea is, is that once you come in, you come in with a set of skills. And not unlike the I know and I want to know, that's really the crux of TC Maker. I know a lot of stuff. Okay, I know a little stuff. Michael knows a lot of stuff. Other people know other stuff. Let's get together. Let's share what we know. Let's collaborate on things. Let's play what if. Hey, what if we turned this weird 3D thing into a 3D printer with incredibly high resolution? That project was actually born in hatch at one of our Wednesday night open houses. And within three weeks was making prints. That's pretty short lead time and pretty phenomenal skill set that went into that. So sharing, sharing with each other, sharing with the community. We have an open house every Wednesday night of the year, starting at 7, allegedly ending at 10, family friendly until 10. At 10.01, get the kids out because <laughs> you never know what I'm going to say, and I'm just, I'm fighting it right here Je and now. Jeff, what time did you leave the shop last night? 4 a.m. We're working on a power wheels racer that has to be on a truck for Kansas City at noon on Friday. So I will be leaving here straight for the shop to weld all night again. But that's cool. Um, I was on share. share. Uh, so we share with the public. We have these open houses. Come, please. Bring your friends. Bring your family. Find out what we're all about. You can show up for every single open house for now until the end of time. And you will never be required to become a member. But we'd love to have you as a member. The final component, the third and final slide in my PowerPoint, learn. We teach each other. We have skills, we share those skills, and sometimes that takes a more formal aspect we put on classes. We have classes for ourselves, we have classes that are open to the public, classes in welding, classes in guitar making, classes in bow making. Uh, we've done a couple of leather working classes. Um, I did a class in knot work. Um, Lock picking, Arduino. Which uh, is a programmable computer. Electronics on board. 101, so learning how to make an LED blink on your own. We have a couple of kit companies that will come in and just do a plain old learn to solder. My 10 year old nephew learned to solder from probably one of the best kit makers on the planet these days, a local guy who's also a member. So, learn. Uh, I also, and I, I don't know whether it comes under sharing or learning, I wanted to pitch the fact that on the last Tuesday of every month, we have a ladies' night. Um, and there are two members of that ladies' night in the audience. I won't out them. I'll let them introduce themselves later, or I'll point them out later if you <laughs> come up and ask me to. But they can give you more about that. Uh, what else am I... We, we have a couple of uh, groups that meet at the Hack Factory in our classroom, a lock sport group, a uh, couple of computer groups, uh, fairly active computer security guys, meaning guys that break into computers. They say they're into security, but I don't buy it. For a living. Like yeah. Their job is to go to companies and break into their computers to see if so it's, if it's secure. So they say. And, and so that's the third component, uh, make, share, learn. And what it really all comes down to is community. So... Once we had the space, 
we realized this is great. We can do all these cool projects. And instead of you know sitting at the coffee shop and being like, well, this would be easy if you had a drill press. Can you come over to my garage and do it next Thursday? We can actually stop and like, oh, well, you should totally talk to Jeff about that because he knows all about knots. Or you should talk to Chris because he knows about wood finishing. And that has expanded all of our creative potential because suddenly instead of just being one person who might know a couple of folks, you know, out of our 120-ish members, not only do we know our members, but we also know other folks in the community. So we have, you know, a number of folks who just don't have the time to re remain members, but, you know, stop motion animation folks, uh, various textile artists, uh, various sculptors, uh, woodblock printers, screen printers, uh, electro electrical engineers. Folks are doing all sorts of really cool stuff. So we've sort of found ourselves where we started off as a community wanting to do more. We found our community stretching well beyond our pretty damn cool little shop, uh, if, I, if I can be so humble. Uh, questions? I, I suppose the, the obvious thing is uh, it costs 55 bucks a month and it is kind of like a 24 hour fitness place. You pay your dues and you badge in at the door and you use the envelope two in the morning. A really big laser cutter, a uh, water jet table, and enough classes in enough wide variety of topics. I, we, I, want, I want to see someone getting our kiln going. We have a kiln that needs some repair. I but, want the uh, kiln in the trash bin. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I, I would love to see us get a thickness sander, which is a really big drum that you can, in addition to planing stuff flat, you can then sand it really, really smooth. Um, it's actually a good time to mention, if you have a garage full of tools that you're not using and you'd like them to go to a good home, we uh, can accept tax deductible donations through Springboard for the Arts. We're shortly to be a 5013C. And uh, just talk to Michael or I if you know of good tools that need a good home and they'll get used. Or even broken tools. Um, our current metal lathe that's in great working shape was donated to us not working at all. It would have been in someone's basement. And they're like, well, it needs a few parts and I don't quite know how to fix it, but you guys can have it. And another member took it and was like, this is great. And you rebuilt it, and now we have a really nice, solid but, vintage metal lathe. Yeah, but I, I want to back off on the stuff because I think well, that really what we want is it, we want more members, we want more things going on. We want you to show up at our open houses and yeah. meet more cool folks. Every Wednesday from 7 ish to 10 ish p.m. Oh, oh. Uh, we are located at 3119 East 26th Street. That's about three or four blocks east of the Hexagon Bar, or if you know where Hiawatha hits 26 at the pedestrian bridge there, go about a mile east. And uh, tcmaker.org. The, the laser cutter classes, we just got a, a, a member owns the laser cutter that we have in the space, and they are setting up their classes. I don't know quite how that's fleshing out, but if you send an email to info at tcmaker.org, we'll bounce your uh, information over to them and get you on the mailing list for that class. Funding. Um, what we had about 50 to 100 members on the internet forum, uh, and we're seeing probably 20 to 30 people at weekly uh, at our coffee shop meetings, which is why we left one coffee shop because they couldn't accommodate us anymore um that's what they say but with even even with that many folks um i mean our membership dues are 50 dollars a month which is reasonably nominal I and mean, that's cheaper than cable it's probably cheaper than most folks cell phone bills but we to get you know 20 30 people to commit to 50 bucks a month with the security deposit for the space with filing for incorporation um, and we lucked out and ended up partnering with another group who was doing exactly the same thing. Um, and had, they were just talking about it, and they're like, oh, we should chat with these guys. And so Twin Cities Maker and Hack Factory merged. Right. That's the origin of the two headed so beast. Twin Cities Twin Maker, Maker was slash the Hack Factory. community group, and Hack Factory had just happened to incorporate it. Uh, and they had a very small group of folks who were willing to commit more cash up front 
than our membership was was able to. And with the two groups combined, we were able to uh, launch really quickly and easily and then had a couple of sort of nudges where we needed to, uh, you know, really go out to our members and say, hey, you know, our lease is, you know, we need to expand um, because we, we either we will lose our space or we have to expand, which is a really great problem to have as opposed to the other direction. And our members came forward and uh, either through prepaying some dues to give us a little bit of upfront capital or uh, some very generous donations. Um, but we operate on about 95% earned income just from membership dues. And I'm told that was the last question. Uh, Michael and I both plan on being here all evening. So if you have more questions, come up and find us. We'd love to meet you, talk to you, hear about what you're doing and what makes you jump for joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, a borderline introvert, so I'll keep this kind of short. But I will say one thing before I introduce Katie. Uh, this is such a cool event. Uh, having a grain belt on top of the grain belt building and talking about craft with people who really know their stuff, this is really a cool event. So applause for the, uh, for the hosts. So Katie Hargrave is, uh, currently lives in Iowa. So as we welcome her to the stage, we're also welcoming her to Minneapolis as she'll be moving here in about a month. Uh, she shared a couple interests uh, with my wife and I as we spoke uh, a bit ago. Uh, she has an interest in beekeeping and is currently planning to build some uh, beehives, which I didn't realize that you built beehives, but she kind of explained the process, which is kind of cool. Um, she, is, uh, she also has an interesting perspective on American history, and I think she's going to share a little bit of that with us. So please welcome Katie Hargrave. Hey there. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about my work and then we're going to do an activity. So maybe I can ask um, Shania and Colin to pass out um, some props. There are scissors. If you wouldn't mind sharing with your neighbor, we're supposed to be getting to know each other. So maybe every other person take one um, so that we'll have enough. And there are little like quarter sheets of paper. Take one of those and then there are, is an instruction sheet. If you don't get one of the little quarter sheets, you can cut up your directions. I'm gonna cut up my notes, so that will be good. Um, I am an artist who came to being interested in craft um, through starting to look, I, I look at the history of America through a critical eye and look at sort of the way that we move around culturally with that history. Um, and I, about two years ago, got interested in the American flag and what the history of that was. I started cutting up all the different star patterns that there had been historically. In case you were curious, fun fact, there are 43 different patterns for the stars for the U.S. Um, and, you know, from there I started making flags for the Mississippi River, flags, flags for the Rio Grande, imaginary altered replica flags. I didn't know how to sew. I had never used a machine or owned a machine. I bought my first machine from a resale shop. It promptly broke, even though they said it had uh, been repaired. Uh, I bought another one from the same shop. It also promptly broke. And then I bought a Bernina, which I love. I'm really happy with it. It's, I'm, you know, it's my workhorse. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning as I go. I'm becoming a craft person. I really have a lot of respect for the idea of a maker. I come from a conceptual art background. So um, there's three main reasons that I am interested in, in craft and the, the way that I sort of come to that. Um, the first being that I think there's a lot of power in objects, right? So when I was a kid, we went along to a lot of uh, battlefields, saw a lot of historic sites. Um, and I'll never forget going to the battlefield at um, Gettysburg when there was a reenactment and hearing the boom and feeling the boom of cannons, you know, in your body, right? There's, there's power, um, real, real, real power in, in physical objects and in places. Um, and when that doesn't exist, you know, Walter Benjamin talked about this in the aura of the object. Um, when that doesn't exist, we try to make it up in some way. So there's a really amazing story of, um, the Mayflower, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a replica, there's a, the Mayflower 2 in uh, Plymouth, 
um, Massachusetts. And when I went there, I thought it was one of those things sort of like George Washington's axe where every piece had been replaced, but it was still, you know, theoretically the authentic object. But it's not. It is a ship that was built um, in England. And to make it seem real, they sent it across the ocean, right? Because if it took the same trip, then it must have some authenticity to it. Um, the second, the second thing that I think is really important is that there's power in symbols. Well, of course, like a symbol, isn't isn't a thing in itself. If we think about the uh, American flag, the you know, who knows what the original American flag was? We we have no, we have we don't have those objects anymore. But there, there are hundreds, thousands, millions of American flags lying around. I saw some uh, across the street from this building. Really cool ones that were. Uh, hanging from cars that were really worn down. I like those. Um, there are, you know, flags made in the U.S. More flags are made in China. And, of course, more are made in Canada, where the most American flags are made. Canada? It's pretty interesting. Um, but, of course, when we see the American flag, it conjures up all of these sort of for good or bad things that we think about America, freedom, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, home of the free and the brave, you know, and then all those terrible things too, domination, whatever, power. There, there's, there's power in symbols. Um, and I'll come back to the American flag and we'll cut up my notes together. Um, and then the third thing is that there's power in the prop. So I make replica flags that are historical objects. I just recently finished um, producing uh, 20 flags from the colonial era that all have pine trees on them. These were real things that then I produced in the world and gave away to friends and acquaintances and asked them to do something with them. Um, I think that there's something, there's something really, really strong in us having an object and uh, interacting with that. So when we learn to become makers, like a lot of us here are, we learn also to become performers, right? We become actors. We have to take some agency over that system. I think that, you know, a lot of the people today are, we're talking sort of about that. And when we, when we have that thing, when we learn how to cut a star from the American flag, then we have some of that power of the American flag and can decide to do what we want with it, right? So, um, the story goes, you all have the directions, that um, Betsy Ross um, supposedly designed uh, the Old Glory flag, the first flag for the US. And she was at a meeting with all the founding fathers and George Washington really, really wanted a six pointed star. Um, his personal army's flag had 13 six pointed stars. And he said, oh, it's, it's easier to make those standardized. Um, so. Let's just, let's go with that. And she said, what are you talking about? Let me show you, it's so easy. And she took a piece of paper. You guys all wanna do this along with me? She folded it in half like a taco or like a mountain maybe. She folded it in half. And then she folded the bottom part up to give herself a little guideline like that. Does that make sense to everyone? And then she took this, she folded it in half this way too, and then unfolded it. And then she took the corner and bent it down to the little first guideline that she made. Okay, back up. <laughs> Fold it in half this way. Give yourself a guideline by folding it up to the top and then fold it back down and fold it in half the other direction and unfold it again. And then take the, 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 the corner, one of the corners, and fold it down to the first guideline that you made. So fold it down halfway. Does that, does that make sense? Hold it up. You got it, you got it. Can you think of a better way to explain it than I am? The intersection, well, no, it's not the intersection of the two lines. You take the corner, the 
and you t and you bring it t at the middle point of the top, down to the intersection of the f the, uh, the across the way half point, the horizontal halfway point. Does that make sense? And then and then okay, hold it up if you got it. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it. Yeah, everybody's pretty close. Woman in the green, you don't have it. <laughs> Can one of your neighbors help you, maybe? You got it. OK. Then take this edge that we just folded down and fold it back over the side like that. So meet it up with the edge that we just made. So just fold it back to the edge, back to the left side. You got it. You got it. You got it, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's perfect. Everyone almost there? Does anyone need me to help you? Most people there, can you help your neighbor if someone has it? Okay, turn it around and do the same thing on the other side. So fold this piece. Well, fold this piece over. I can't remember how to do this now. <laughs> so take, turn it up, turn it around and fold it back to the edge that you made before. So it'll end up looking like this from the front. So it should line up with the first little triangle piece that you made. Perfect. You're really good at this. <laughs> okay, I'll help you afterwards if you haven't quite gotten it. If you're an expert, I have um, some canvas and nylon, so if you wanna start making your own American flag, we can do that too. The, the really important thing is to take the scissors and make one snip about an inch down on one side up to about a half an inch on the other side. There you go, that's perfect. And you should be able to unfold a pretty much perfect five-pointed star. Just fold the other side over. Fold that back like that. Who got it? You did not get it. Perfect. Now that <laughs> I'll help you guys later. That's perfect. I'll help you later. <laughs> yeah, these are these are amazing. This is this is great. Who got it? Hold theirs up if you got it. Bravo. <laughs> OK, the, 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 the end of the story. <laughs> so, so the thing that's really amazing about this, this is a, this is a, really, this is a really lovely little story. Um, and it, you know, this is the, this is this is some of the power that the the stars and bars has. This is the power of the old glory. We just learned how to do that. But the story that I just told you is all a fiction, right? So Betsy Ross did really sew flags for the Navy, but she started sewing flags for them in 1777, and that's not when the first flag was designed. And she also would not have been able to have designed Old Glory, the, the 13 stars in a circle that we know as being, you know, Betsy Ross's flag, because that, that flag was designed in 1790. And no one remembered who Betsy Ross was until her grandson wrote her biography in 1870. So... There you go. That's some of the power. We took it. We have it. I'll teach you how to get it later if you didn't figure it out. <laughs> Thanks, guys.
It's kind of a classic Minneapolis summer evening feeling where it feels like it's going to go on and on. It feels like the sun hasn't really changed, but it has. And we're over half done, and we only have three more things. So let's enjoy them. Um, the next thing is I promised that one presentation would come from someone in the audience who didn't know that they were going to make a presentation. So we call these flash presentations, and there's more pointing. I'm just going to point at some of you and ask you to say what you know in this instance. And we're going to use uh, the OO voting scale. So make an OO noise, all of you. Uh, commensurate with how much you want to hear about that topic. Um, so uh, we'll try this. I'll point at about seven people, and we'll see who knows something that we all want to know about the most. Um, so I will, p and some people are looking down deliberately. <laughs> that won't work. Um, let's say you in the green shirt and the hat. Tie a trucker hitch. All right. Cool. <laughs> um, and let's do um, you in the gray shirt. Okay. It's always a hit. Um, and let's do you in the pattern shirt right here. What do you know? <laughs> this all sounds so delicious. Um, let's do um, you in, in the glasses, the dark glasses, right by the cameraman. And you. Knows how to make a layer cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many mmms, yeah. The mmms don't count in the ooh voting scale. Um, and you in the bow tie. That was a pretty sincere ooh. I think we have a new front runner. Um, but we'll try uh, just a couple more comp competitors here. Um, how about you in the um, with the red collar? Back there. Do yeah. <laughs> I feel good about our collective knowledge. I feel like if we were really in trouble together, we would be we would be okay. Um, should we go with a bow tie? All right. What's your name? All right. Please welcome Perry. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, so the secret to tying a bow tie is you guys actually all also know how to tie a bow tie, but you just don't know it. It's um, the same as tying your shoelaces, only it's up at your face. <laughs> so um, first you go over and under, and how many of you guys learned the rabbit thing? I didn't, so um, then you fold this one over and the top part goes over the back and then you need the scissors from under your chair <laughs> and then you pull the other part from the back and you pull it through and then you have a bow tie and the important part is it's supposed to look messy because you're wearing a bow tie and you don't want it to look like a clip-on bow tie and that's how you tie a bow tie Hi. Ooh. Mike brought the spin art that's powered by his daughter's bicycle, and he happens to be the mayor of the smallest town in Minnesota. You can pick up his one-page newspaper from him in person, I'm guessing. He's a really cool guy, and I just met him. Come on up, Mike. Thank you, Meg. Uh, thank you all, too, for having me up here to your big city. It's, it's a little intimidating. I'm used to addressing three people, and they're all related to me on a plot of land about as big as this deck, so uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm Mike Haig. I, uh, 2003, I established Mount, Ho uh, Mount Holly, Minnesota, which is Minnesota's small, small town. Uh, the city was established on a foundation of uh, graciousness and generosity. And uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir when I talk about that, because they're here tonight. 
be sing singing right afterwards. <laughs> but I'm also preaching to all you guys. You guys all came here with something to offer, and you, you're, you're, you know, that, that's what you brought to the table tonight. So I think a round of applause for everybody who brought something tonight. Yeah. All right, that ate up about 10 seconds. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why I established a city here. I mean, that was my craft. I, uh, it took me two years to do it, uh, but it starts way before a lot of logistics that most people want to know about. They're like, oh, what kind of paperwork did it take? What did you have to do? You know, did you declare war on America? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, but I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> it all start, it started a long time ago, and I, I, I just like to see a, a show of hands for people who grow up grew up in a time before there was the internet in your high school. Remember how awesome that was? How alone you felt in this world, and how valuable every piece of communication and contact you had with another person was at that time. I'm not dissing the internet. It does a lot of great things. You know, we, we can put our storefronts on there. We can connect to each other. But it just seems that the connections that we have on an everyday basis, the conversations that we have, and the things that we give and take to each other have been minimized to like buttons and retweets instead of a sweater or a meal or a cupcake or painting, right? Uh, and there... <laughs> Yeah, daddy-o. <laughs> so uh, I was lucky enough to be really fucking lonely in high school in the late 80s <laughs> and really unpopular in, in college uh, in the early 90s. Uh, I was studying uh, st fine arts and I dropped out because I felt like it was just uh, fine arts was a program that served the individual. They taught you how to do things for your, express yourself, right? And to me, that just seemed really self-serving, and I was also paying cash for college, so I'm like, huh, crap, I'm not going to make a living on this. So I dropped out. Uh, I, told, I told my counselor on the last day of school I wanted to drop out. She's like, why? I said, I want to make toys and draw shitty comic books. And so I dropped out, and I started making toys and shitty comic books. Well, not toys. I, didn't have, I, w I lived in an apartment, but I started making shitty comic books, so I got a job at Kinko's. So th there was something really phenomenal uh, about the Xerox culture in the, in the early 90s. Uh, the only way to connect with each other was through like reviews and other magazines that you liked or comic books or poetry magazines or Fact Sheet 5. And when you connected, y yeah, right? <laughs> and uh, it, it was really amazing because you would connect with these people and a lot of times you could just swap and the swaps might be imbalanced or whatever, but everything came with a letter. You know, and it was a letter in somebody's own handwriting, which even if it was a short letter, it was great, but they, they never were. They were designed envelopes. You know, there might be a mixtape thrown in there from the great bands in their town. And there was such a value there because it was not readily accessible and because of the thought that went into it, but mostly because of the generosity. They were thinking about you at the end. And I think that's the magic of craft, right? So, uh, so I did that for a while, <laughs> and then uh, I moved to Olympia, Washington, where most outsiders ended up in the mid-90s, and, and it was absolutely fabulous. Uh, I was coming out of my first marriage, which was horrible, and uh, moving into a, 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 a very, very generous community. I, I don't know how much of you, many of you know about Olympia. I mean, you could write, somebody needs to write a whole book about what happened from 1991 to the year 2001 in Olympia, Washington. But uh, it was a fabulous place where everybody lived in these kind of, they weren't communal houses. They were houses that were taken over by punks and given personalities and the rooms were rented out. So the houses became individuals which was just amazing. There was the pirate house. It was a pink house that, that raised a pirate flag. There was the witch house, and that was the house that was, I don't know why they call it the witch house, but their toilet never works. There was, uh, I lived in the Lucky Seven house, uh, which was a prime real estate because it was right next to the Lucky Seven food store. Uh, but the beautiful thing about these houses was you would walk into every room and it was curated out of garbage, out of the shit at hand. And it was beautiful. It was like a set 
uh, probably the closest that you can get to it is like watching the movie Slacker. I don't know if any of you have seen that. But it was like living in that environment, except for that movie had so much alienation in it. And, in, and these houses in Olympia exuded a, a huge generosity. If you had an event at least once every two weeks because you wanted to kind of give to the community that was going there. And you know, outside of the houses, you had things like the Super 8 Film Ranch going on. You had four open uh, performance spaces that were booked every night in a, in a city of like 30,000 people. It was, re- well, ever, well, it was none of the evergreen people that were doing it, though. They all just sat out at the college swapping fish tapes and getting stoned. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so I lived. So I lived there for six years, and then uh, during that time, I ran a printing press for the Association of Washington School Principals. It was a '50s AB Dick 360 offset. It was a beautiful machine, and uh, but it was <laughs> it was totally outdated for what they wanted to do. I, I managed to talk them into uh, upgrading to a digital machine, and then. We drugged the machine out of the basement and started a print co-op there, the second print co-op. There was a letterpress co-op. We were the first offset co-op. Uh, but I was doing these two things at the same time. So I was like doing work, and then I was doing like art and fun stuff at night. I was doing design work for record labels. You know, I, I had a band called the Abominable Showman. And in the, the band consisted of me in an ape suit and two guys dressed as hunters, and we would write three surf instrumentals the night before the show. And at the end of the show, I would throw my guitar down, and they would try to catch me with a net. It was awesome. Uh, but uh, but this, the spirit of generosity, I, I, I decided that I wanted to combine the things. I was a hard worker, and I wanted to do art, and I always said, I'm going to keep these things separate because I don't want to ruin, I don't want to ruin the fun of art, man. And so I decided to come back and go to advertising school here in Minneapolis. There was a little place that was in a bombed out warehouse back in the day, and it was gold for like three years, Brain Co. I don't know if anybody didn't know what that used to be. Uh, Now it's in a bank in Hopkins. (laughs) Draw your own conclusions. Uh, But I moved back here, and I was was from here originally, and I was really glad to come back and and, uh, be with my family and be back in Minneapolis. Uh, just because I, I love the winters here. I love the spirit of like half the year you go out and you interact with people and you try to get as much of people as you can. And then the other half of the year, you do something. You know, you're in your house and you're thinking, you reflect. And I think that's what makes the, the city great. And it's also what, what makes craft great, right? I mean, craft without an audience or without a recipient, it's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just self-serving. Well, it so happened that as I moved back, my sister was getting married, and she uh, kind of pushed me together with one of her friends from seventh grade, who's now the first lady of Mount Holly, Minnesota, Tammy Dalkey. <laughs> For the record, she knows how to play accordion, and she'd like to know your mom. <laughs> uh, so uh, we were living in Minneapolis at the time, and you know we got married, and uh, I have a stepson uh, with, with Tammy, and... Uh, we were looking for a house early 2000s you couldn't buy a house in Minneapolis for anything I mean it was just ridiculous and we spent every weekend out in Shockby anyhow because we went to see our families and so uh, we decided to move out and back to Shakopee I mean I never thought that would happen I, part of me was really glad about because I liked kind of the haptic response that happens to life when you're in a town where you know people uh, I think crafters tend to be really aware of their environment, right? You're always responding to whatever materials you have, and the materials change, and these sorts of things. But when you get that response when it actually performs the way you want it to, there's just a, a magical spot there. Well, I feel that way about people in everyday life. Like, I love the idea. I love that when if somebody honks at me, I know it's not because I'm doing something stupid. <laughs> It's because it's like, hey, it's the guy I used to sell steaks to at the butcher shop when I was 16, and he recognizes me. Um, so anyway, so we moved back out there, but we left all of our friends in Minneapolis. I mean, we're moving 30 miles out of town. So this is where this graciousness and generosity comes back in. In establishing our, our city, we first, as, as many homesteaders did, you look for the things that you need that, to, to survive. So we found a little house on a corner block, uh, one owner, 1941, nothing had been done to it. It had one coat of paint on it. 
public library at the end of the block, six bars two blocks away, and a railroad right in between. That's my escape route. <laughs> and, uh, and we moved in. Uh, we, we lived there for a little while, and I'm like, how are we going to get our friends to come out here? And I started to realize that it was the same problem that most cities have, especially, I mean, and Shakopee actually has that problem. You think about the amount of tourist traffic that goes through Shakopee for the racetrack, the casino, Valley Fair. Nobody goes down here. How, how many people here have ever been to downtown Shakopee? Did you get your tires changed? I and mean, that's all there is down there. <laughs> so we decided that we were going to live there for the rest of our lives. And if we bought this house, it was ours. We could do anything we wanted with it. So it was a little selfish at first, right? But then we, we started to think about this whole premise of getting our friends to come out. In order to do that, we had to be generous. And, and we had to start to craft events and experiences for these people. So we started publishing a newspaper, uh, the Mount Holly Register. Uh, we, st we, have, we started having events during the year. We have a, a city festival the first Saturday in August every year. Always has a different theme. We have a film, international film festival the first Saturday in November. Uh, the best one we had was an international short film festival. It was uh, four years ago. Uh, we showed seven movies from around the world that all starred little people. <laughs> it was fabulous. Uh, we, uh, I have a friend who's a traveling vegan chef. He comes through for the Mount Holly soybean feed. <laughs> um, but we did all these things because we knew that we had to give you don't deserve anything in this world, right? Life is what you make it, and the connections that you, the connections are what you make of it. And it's the same thing with the craft, right? A good piece of wood isn't going to turn into a bowl. You've got to think about how that bowl is going to be at the end, where, where it's going to be used, the purpose of that thing to, to help that bowl turn into something. And that's what we've tried to do with our city. Um, I'm, am I making sense here? Okay. So, uh, so anyways, we, we did establish our city. We're on Google Maps. Uh, we, I invite you all to come down and visit sometime. The, the core values of our city are generosity. We want, we want to teach people. I wanted to teach my kids. I want to teach my neighbors that you can make more fun than, than you can buy. And it doesn't take much. And with a spirit of generosity, you can't lose. Uh, I do have some newspapers, if anybody would like some. We're, we'll have some spin art going uh, earlier. Perry, sorry about the jacket. Uh, but it, the newspaper has a, a few of our events that are going on this year. We have, a, uh, we're, we have an open gallery, a 24-hour open gallery in the fall. We're having an exhibition of art and craft made from a single six-foot length of two-by-four. Uh, oh, and, and one last thing. I'll make it quick, promise. Uh, we also have a, a, a pole in our front yard where anybody, anybody in the world can send an arrow to, up to Mount Holly uh, pointing to whatever they want, and I'll put it up on my pole. And in return, you'll get an individually hand-numbered Mount Holly arrow that you can put up wherever you're at, pointing to Mount Holly. So that we have, again, it's that generosity and that, that, that tactile. This is not a like. This is not a retweet. That we will exchange something personal and handcrafted. Uh, the latest one I got is right here. It's crafted from high-carbon fiber. It's to Bernier's Rink in Woodbury, Minnesota, free skating lessons. So again, thanks for having me. Go out and make something. Be generous.